Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland. In the studio with me today, I have Dr. Paul C. Green. Dr. Green is an industrial organizational psychologist and the architect of the behavioral interviewing technique, which is used to select employees for a wide variety of jobs worldwide. In addition, he's the author of More Than a Gut Feeling and an interview training video produced by Media Learning International that has been seen by over 3 million viewers over the past 30 years. Action Speak, his most current book on interviewing, is designed for the interviewer and for the job seeker. His book, Get Hired, Winning Strategies to Ace the Interview, shows you how to prepare for an interview and gives specific examples of what to say to get hired. Paul, thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, Angela. Well, I really appreciate you sitting down. You have really been studying this field for many years, I think probably over 30 years. All my life. In fact, you said 30 years. I think I was six when I started. Okay. I'm stretching the truth there a little bit. (laughs) Well, can you help our listeners to understand what exactly is a behavioral interview? Okay. A behavioral interview is uh, an interview that focuses on past actions. And the basic premise is that by knowing what someone has done, you're better able to predict what that person will do. So past actions are the best predictors of future performance. That's the basic premise. Okay. Or saying it another way, it's just common sense. Right. We know that people tend to not change. Once they build habits, those habits tend to continue into the future. Mm -hmm. So as interviewers, if we can tap into their job-related habits, Mm -hmm. then we're more likely to be able to assess what their skills are for a job. Right. And, you know, this is a very common kind of interview that people encounter at many jobs that they go and look for. Um, So I know the last time we spoke, we also talked about the concept of a structured interview. Can you help me to understand a little bit about what is a structured interview? A structured interview is a list of pre-planned questions. In fact, uh, our listeners can't see, but uh, we have a structured interview here, and I'll just kind of describe it. And also, as I describe it, uh, later we'll give you a way to contact me. And if you would like to get access to this interview, I'll send it to you. The structured interview that, that we're talking about and that you can get is for a lead technician. This is for a specific job, mm-hmm. probably a job in a big company. And the structured interview has pre-planned questions that are organized in clusters, and the Mm -hmm. clusters tend to go together uh, underneath competencies. Mm -hmm. So the interviewer will ask pre-planned questions. They're also designed to be job-related questions. That's the way interviewers get in trouble. They ask questions that aren't related to the job. Right. So so what we want to do is, for the interviewer side, Mm -hmm. is to control what they say and keep them job related. That's what a structured interview does. Oh, absolutely. That's that's great information. So, if I'm a job seeker and I'm, you know, getting ready for an interview and I, and I have a, you know, I'm suspecting it's going to be a behavioral interview in particular. Mm-hmm. What can I do to prepare myself to, you know, do my very best? Good. The um, and and you said something very insightful. You're suspecting it's going to be a behavioral interview. Right. Roughly uh, and I know this from from estimates and surveys, roughly 40% of interviews that are done in the world today, that's not just here, but also internationally, mm-hmm. are, are, are behavioral interviews. So these types of interviews are, are something you can expect primarily mm-hmm. with large employers. Mm-hmm. They have the uh, resources to train their interviewers in terms of how to do a behavioral, or I, I prefer to call them behavior-based interview, interviews now. Sure. But uh, with the behavior-based interview, that you have training to help the interviewers be able to do this, and, and they're, they're prevalent mm-hmm. uh, uh, primarily with large organizations. Oh, that's great. Um, so as I'm preparing myself sort of to go into that interview, is there anything that I can you know do to ensure that you know I'm as ready as I possibly can be? I mean, since it sounds like at least half of the time, or, not, well, maybe a little less than half, I'm going to yeah. be encountering that kind of an interview. Yeah, yeah the, the key is preparation. Okay. In fact, I, uh, I tell people all the time the three basic rules for mm-hmm. being a good, good, 
candidate in an interview, and that is to prepare and to prepare and to prepare. Oh, I like that. <laughs> That's simple. <laughs> right. And what that means is that you find a list of questions that you think are going to be asked for this type of job mm -hmm. that you're going to be considered for. So you get the list of questions. Often you can get them on the Internet, and I won't name different websites, but you could get lists of questions. Mm -hmm. And when you have the questions that you think are target questions for the job, I'm going to suggest that you get about 20 of those questions. And for each one of those questions, write out an answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't have to be a very detailed write-up, but just with pen or pencil in hand, right. write down what it is that you're going to use in the answer mm -hmm. that will help you focus and pay attention and also that will help you do something very important, which is be specific. Right. Interviewers today look for specific information. They want to know exactly what you did, when you did it, who was there, what mm -hmm. the results were, how they could measure the results. So specifics is what can, what interviewers want to, to get and what candidates need to get. That's the key to preparation. No, I totally agree. I think sometimes interviewers uh, may say, oh, sure, I can do that, or of course I have that skill. But if you can't demonstrate a past example, mm -hmm. it's really not very convincing. You know, and what you're kind of preparing is these stories that, you know, truthful yeah. stories, yeah. but stories that demonstrate the kind of work that you do in the past and what yeah. you'll do in the future. Yeah, and you said a magic word for me, truthful. Right. Sometimes people think, oh, well, I'll, well, I'll make up this or I'll borrow a story that somebody else no. said. You can't do that. It, no, it's it, very important to yeah. be truthful. you got to be truthful, and you can be truthful and really sell yourself better mm -hmm. because truthful answers ring true. And mm -hmm. when you when you give those truthful answers, you're much more likely to to be credible in terms of the information that you're given. Right, and I think it's not always uh, necessary to have experience in a hundred percent of every single thing that they ask you about. Mm -hmm. It'd be better if you had ninety five percent, you know, experience in ninety five percent of the areas, but you were truthful that you didn't have five percent than if you were to say you had a hundred percent covered. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're not going to find probably the most perfect candidate ever, but they are going to try to find the most honest or the most, you know, trustworthy that they can trust with their sort of company. Well, let me fine tune this just a little bit. You said um, trustworthy and the most honest as if mm -hmm. that's something that they're looking for. And that's true. Interviewers do look for that, particularly in jobs in banking mm -hmm. or accounting right. or where there's some kind of fiduciary responsibility. Right. So, in true interviews, though, the interviewer is going to look for much more than that. They're going to oh, look absolutely. for competencies or, or dimensions or skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's really the, the diversity that happens. So you have to pre-play and answers to all sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. And you don't uh, have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Being perfect is, uh, is really a, uh, an inhibitor for having a smooth, flowing interview. Right. So it's okay to admit you're not perfect. Right, absolutely, you know, because nobody is perfect. That's true. <laughs> um, another thing we talked about before, you know, that I think is really interesting is you mentioned to me a technique that you use with your clients called the share technique. Yeah. And I was wondering, can you share with our listeners a little bit about what the share technique is and yeah. how they might use it? Yeah, the, uh, the technique emerged when I was... Uh, coaching people who were doing a job search. These mm -hmm. were basically outplaced employees. Mm -hmm. And spontaneously, they were giving answers, but they just had different components of a good answer. Mm -hmm. So share is a way to organize the components of a great answer. Mm -hmm. So think of it like this. You hear the question, then you begin the answer by referring to a situation mm -hmm. in which you took action. Mm -hmm. That's the S. The H is a hindrance or a problem. Just think of it like this. If you don't have anything that's a problem or any real challenge in the situation, you don't have a way to show your skills. So you say the situation, a hindrance, then you describe the actions that you took, mm -hmm. then the results that were gained, and then you evaluate the answer. Mm -hmm. Now, this sounds like a lot, but it can move very quickly. Right. And answers like this, if they can be 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go over a minute, uh, you're probably too long with them. But it organizes your answers. So share works. So it sounds like, uh, you know, earlier you mentioned preparation, preparation, mm -hmm. preparation. And 
and anticipating the kinds of questions that you may be asked and, and sitting yeah. down and kind of writing some notes, yeah. I would assume you might recommend to organize those notes within the share technique. Is that, you are, you are is so, that true? You are so smart. <laughs> you got it just right. Good. Actually, okay. actually what you do is you um, – you have the questions, mm-hmm. and you, you think of good, honest answers that, that are things that you've really done in your past. Mm-hmm. And you organize those answers according to share, situation, hindrance, action, results, and evaluation. So you get this together. You write it down. Mm-hmm. So then you have about 20 questions, something like that, mm-hmm. with these share uh, examples. And, and I know our listeners will think, golly, I'll never come up with this. But trust me, mm-hmm. you will. <laughs> uh, just just by taking the time to think about what you've done, you will come up with really good answers. Mm-hmm. And those answers uh, can work in multiple ways for you. So even if you get a question that you think you don't know the answer to, you can borrow an answer from another uh, question that you've worked on mm-hmm. or borrow an example so you can kind of match and mingle your different answers depending on the question. Sure. And, you know, I think actually... This technique translates somewhat also into the resume where I really Mm -hmm. work with my clients to say, put the results, put numbers in your resume where you can really communicate what you've done. Not just, um, yes, I've worked on email marketing, for example, but what were the results? You know, how large were the campaigns and what difference did it make? By the way, I have to say I read your book this morning. Oh, good. (laughs) Great. Just great. Thank you so much. It's uh, you're revealing part of your own personal process and, and mm-hmm. finding uh, finding a place for yourself. Mm-hmm. And that was good. But also the thing that I really liked the most was a list of action verbs. Oh, thanks. Yeah. That, that was just tremendous because in resume preparation, you want to begin every sentence mm-hmm. with an action verb mm-hmm. that shows that you took action. It's not just a self-description. Right. It's something that you actually did. And, and then it can follow with the numbers. It's, that was just great. Well, I appreciate that. It was um, definitely interesting to sort of write about my own job-seeking adventures uh, in the book. So I appreciate that. Um, So one thing, you know, we're really talking right now about communication. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there are situations where, say, a highly technical job seeker, say someone who's interviewing for an engineering position, for example, is going through an interview process and sometimes they end up speaking with someone who is less technical. Say it's the HR person or it's some other member of the team who, who's not quite as technical as they are. You know, do you have any tips on how somebody who has really technical expertise can communicate with someone who is less technical in an effective way in an interview setting? Great. You're making me think of something I did um, years ago in um, uh, Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. One of my clients is a major computer company, mm-hmm. and um, they asked me to teach their research engineers how to conduct interviews, that is, how to be interviewers. Okay. Um, there were 25 PhDs in the room, and one person had, didn't have his PhD yet. Mm-hmm. So basically, you would think that this group would want to talk about technology, mm-hmm. but for interviewing, they really wanted to talk about personal skills. Mm -hmm. In other words, can the person function as part of a team? Right. Can the individual cope with stress and disappointment? Uh, Does the individual have skills in terms of innovation Mm -hmm. or creativity? So all of these, what are called uh, performance skills, are things that those engineers were really looking for. Mm -hmm. So if we take that and reverse it, what we have then is a job candidate who might, let's say, be an engineer, like you are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in your interviews, individuals are going to want to ask you about your knowledge and your engineering skills. Mm-hmm. However, with your answers, it's desirable to mix technical information with some sort of performance skill or interpersonal skill mm-hmm. that you can use in doing your job. So mix it together mm-hmm. so it's not just all technical and it's not all soft skills or performance skills. Mm-hmm. You have a blend there. And that's something that's very important. Just just as an aside, um, I have a friend who uh, worked uh, with one of the, the biggest uh, computer companies in the world. Mm-hmm. She's an expert in competencies. Okay. And I was asking her about technical competencies as opposed to performance competencies. Okay. And she said uh, they had done a study on it and they found 
that when someone did not succeed in the job, it was never because of a lack of technical skill. Right. It was always a result of interpersonal skills or performance skills or mm -hmm. coping skills. So there was something beyond the technical skill that was a problem that caused a failure. Mm -hmm. So that's why their interviews were a balance, not just of technical information, but also the performance information too. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, you know, I, I think there are sometimes, I work with clients who come in and maybe they went through a behavioral interview and they were asked a question that they either had no answer for or that the answer that they had was a negative answer. Those are both pretty tough situations. Yeah. I mean, what kind of guidance do you give in terms of, you know, if you have no answer for a question or if you have a negative answer, what do you do in those two situations? Well, uh, you will always have an answer if you do your share preparation. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you, if you make your list of questions and you come up with 20 specific share examples, then you will always have something that you can pull on. Mm -hmm. So you can always have an answer. And also, let me say, a, a good interviewer it will sense that you can't come up with an answer, and then they will progressively uh, weaken or lessen the parameters of the question mm -hmm. so that they make the question easier mm -hmm. so that you have a good experience at the end of the question. Mm -hmm. Because no good interviewer wants to make a candidate have lower self-esteem because of not being able to answer a question. Right. So a good interviewer will do that. But if the interviewer doesn't do that, one of the things you can do is admit a mistake mm -hmm. or admit a failure. And there's a way to do this that works for you. It involves this. Yes, um, you asked me about uh, my, let's say it's a weakness. You asked me what my biggest weakness was, and I have to admit, I'm not going to give you my real weakness, but I have to admit <laughs> that uh, I have a weakness in, when it comes to doing such and such. And um, I really have learned from this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the last time the weakness came into play was maybe uh, 15 years ago when I worked at ABC. Oh. And notice you're, you're moving the behavior right. way back in the past. Right. And you're recognizing the weakness, and then you're converting the weakness into something that you have learned. Mm -hmm. So it's a skill in conversion. Mm -hmm. You convert something that's a negative into a positive, a positive behavior. This uh, is consistent with the idea that learning today is one of the major, major needs of corporations. Mm -hmm. They want people who are constantly learning. And yes, that they constant do. learning is something you can speak to when you get a negative question. I think that's such a, a great idea because you're really, you're answering their question about the weakness, for example, yep. but you're also separating yourself and you're showing that it's in your past. It's not really that's something right. that you're dealing with now. That's right. And also you're showing that you're continuing to grow that's right. in your career. I think that's a great, that's right. a great suggestion. Yeah. Um, so this kind of leads me into, you know, you mentioned earlier that a lot of the times during an interview, we're trying to focus on our skills and what we can do for the company. And sometimes we get asked questions that don't really have to do with our skills. And that's that's why companies are using this type of behavior interviewing. Um, occasionally we encounter, and I know I have, we encounter uh, be questions that are illegal. Mm -hmm. First of all, can you mention a couple of the types of questions that would be illegal and then how you would recommend that we answer them? Because, I mean, it's very tricky. You don't want to upset the person who's interviewing you, but you also don't necessarily want to give up that information. That's true. Um, I've, I've had so much experience with this just in doing I've had over 100,000 people in my classes, and, and they bring this up all the time. These mm -hmm. are the interviewers about right. what's legal. So at a basic level, it goes like this. Women are more uh, likely to have illegal questions with regard to child care. Yes. <laughs> or they're likely to have questions with regard to uh, uh, their lifestyle, whether or not they're married, all of, the, all of these attendant issues. Mm -hmm. So when you get a question like that, it's okay, I think, to say, well, um, just to completely ignore it. Mm -hmm. uh, like, um, how many children do you have? So I'm going to give the answer. Um, well, uh, that's something I've thought about over the years, and let me say that uh, I am a career person. 
Right. I work hard, and uh, I give all of my time and attention that I possibly can to my work. And actually, uh, if you talk to people who I've worked around before, they, they would just be astonished to know that uh, I spend as many hours as I do at work. Mm-hmm. I work uh, nights, weekends, <laughs> Saturdays, Sundays, you, you name it. Uh, I'm a very driven person. And I just want to promise you that you will never be disappointed with my ability to do a job well. Absolutely. I mean, because really a lot of times when they ask these questions, they are digging into what you alluded to, which is, will you be able to do the job? And so it's really putting them back on the point that I'm committed, I can do this job, you don't have to worry about me. That's right. Um, But at the same time, not stopping the interview and saying, hey, this question is illegal, (laughs) <laughs> I don't think we should be covering this right now because I don't think that's going to help, you know, to get yeah. a job either. Yeah, that's kind of a showstopper. But, right. <laughs> but still, I mean, uh, sometimes I, I've had people who are doing a job search. They say, well, so can they ask me this question? I said, uh, technically not, but do you want the job? Right. Well, yeah. I said, okay, it's a lot better uh, to go ahead and get a job than to hire an attorney. Wouldn't you right. agree? <laughs> So inevitably, people say yes. And you have to keep in mind that you might have an idiot as an mm-hmm. interviewer who doesn't know how, how life works, who doesn't know the law, mm-hmm. but they, they just, they're asking the only thing that they know to have, which, by the way, having a structured interview kind of protects candidates from that. Right, right. So the interviewer who does this uh, can be helped and uh, I encourage people to help the interviewers and not have a confrontation unless sometimes the interviews just get to be abusive. Okay. And uh, if if something's abusive, it's a free world. Mm-hmm. Get up and walk out. Right. I mean, you probably don't want to work there anyway if it gets that's, to that point. That's exactly right. Right, yeah. right. And I think if people have questions about what, you know, exactly what questions are illegal. If you go out and you search online, there are lists of illegal interview questions that you just may want to review if it's something you're concerned with. Um, You know, I have noticed, I've rarely seen companies that train their employees on what to ask and what not to ask. I think a lot of times Mm -hmm. they assume that the interviewer would know kind of what those things are, and sometimes the person just doesn't know. So they may ask you something and not even realize that they are not supposed to. Yeah, yeah. So I think kind of laughing it off and refocusing on, you know, really your work is, yeah. is probably the best strategy. It, it really gives you a chance to take charge in a right. different way. Right, So it's almost like a role reversal where you're teaching the interviewer mm-hmm. not to ask that type of question. Right. Yeah, and, you know, if you can just kind of move past it, I think it probably won't negatively impact you too yeah. much yeah. in the interview. Plus, the person who asks you that question, they may not even be the decision maker. So what you just oftentimes you just don't want to raise a red flag with anyone. You know, the decision maker is probably not going to be the one who asks you that question, I would think. I have to say that um, along the way, I've I've been around a lot of people doing job searches, and I've I've been around tons of interviewers, Mm -hmm. uh, probably several hundred thousand I've had in my classes. Mm -hmm. And this always comes up. And when it comes up, most people... Most people who are interviewers, they're open to to input. No, don't do this. Instead, use your structured interview and your pre-planned questions. They protect you. They protect the candidates. Mm-hmm. And it gives you a chance to show dignity and relax without jumping into questions that are inappropriate. Mm-hmm. But then every once in a while, somebody really wants to argue about it. Well, I think I need to know about so-and-so and such-and-such. And then they give a little example and... Uh, as an instructor, uh, what I've done is just say, stop, don't, don't say this, because mm-hmm. I don't want other people to even hear in my presence mm-hmm. somebody giving an excuse for asking that type of question. Mm-hmm. So it's okay, I think, to be firm, and it's okay to be real clear about it. Of course, you don't want to get into violence or anything like sure, that. Sure, sure. But uh, violence does happen to people because of inappropriate questions. And they have had these bad feelings that kind of drag along, and they, they continue. Um, it's not good. Um, one of the, the big things I used to say was that think of every candidate as mm-hmm. a customer. Sure. So would you offend a customer? Right, and right. And the answer is no. 
Right, because they're going to walk out and share with other people what their experience was. That's right. And if you decide that you like them, you know, you want them to come work for you. That's right. So you want to have a positive experience, whether it's the right candidate or whether it's not the right candidate. That's right. Um, so we focus mainly on behavior type based interviews. I know that sometimes an interviewer goes in to an interview and they're kind of really prepared for these types of questions and then they're thrown maybe a curveball. Um, in my experience, uh, one time, for example, I had to do a math problem in front of a panel of people or I've had to been thrown in to do an IQ exam or um, a writing test or writing a computer program. Do you ever... Um, how would, do you have any suggestions for those sort of one-offs that you're really, you're just not quite prepared for and then suddenly you're, you know, you're doing a math problem in front of five people? I mean, <laughs> like, I mean, the, be the best way to sort of like work your way through that when it happens? I have a, a section on this in my uh, Get Hired book. Mm -hmm. And basically it talks about these, I call them, um, weird questions or strange questions or whatever. Right. Uh, one of them that's been popular is how many gas stations are there in the United States? Mm -hmm. um, okay. an another one is uh, how does a hummingbird fly? Okay. Uh, another one is um, uh, where did the light go when it went out? Right. That's a Stephen Wright joke, by the way. Mm -hmm. And they ask these questions, and when I ask people why they ask the questions, they say, I just want to see how they think. Mm -hmm. And another way to say it is, I want to um, uh, get a handle on how good they are on their feet mm -hmm. and so forth. Well, if you want to get a handle on how good somebody is on their feet, uh, watch them give a presentation. Right. If you want to see how somebody thinks, uh, send them to a psychologist, and, and they can do that. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be a good interviewer, you stick to behavior. That's why mm -hmm. I talk about behavior-based interviews. Mm -hmm. So that's a way to, to deal with it. Now, how to answer the question, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's appropriate to have in your mind a list of benefits. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, um, how does a hummingbird fly? Here's an answer. Um, you know, I thought about this when I was doing my website, mm -hmm. and um, I put a hummingbird on my website for some period of time because I know that flying is important. Right. And flying is a good way to move ahead. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's good to move ahead by doing things that aren't engineeringly possible. Right. So it's a vision. And I think it's important for us to all have that, particularly in the mission of a company or an organization. We all need to be hummingbirds who are doing things that are impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's great. I mean, it's such a good answer. And I think often, you're right, people want to see how you think and they want to see how you might react. Um, you know, I think for me, the most, the interview I had that was really like that a lot, you mentioned presentations. Mm -hmm. I interviewed uh, over 10 years ago for a sales position. And uh, when I went in for the interview, the interviewer gave me a marker and a whiteboard and said, I'll be back in five minutes. You're here to sell yourself and left the room. <laughs> so I think his really, his technique was how will she react under pressure and what will mm -hmm. she do? And I, I think really in those cases, the best thing is just to be cool, you know, stay calm and collected and just move through it the best that you can. And it depends how much you want the job. Right. And uh, there, there's no reason why you shouldn't be prepared mm -hmm. to do that. Right. It, just knowing you, like I've grown to know you in our 30 minutes of being around each other. Right. I think, uh, I think you would do just fine with that. Yeah, I did get an offer. <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> but um, it was surprising, you know. Yeah. Um, you and definitely people in big companies it. do this. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it just blows my mind to see, see how it works. And... Mm -hmm. uh, um, you can't fault a big company for success, mm -hmm. but big companies do have some people who should never have been hired. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would blame it on this type of technique or approach. Sure. <laughs> that makes sense. Well, you know, the last time that we met, we also talked a little bit about the skill benefit statement that you use with your clients and I think also in your book. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah, it's a way to convert your speech 
into a very basic sales presentation. Mm -hmm. And there are two elements to a skill benefit statement. And the first element is, I can. Mm -hmm. And the second element is, so I'll be able to for you. I can, so I'll be able to for you. That's the two elements of it. So here's uh, an example. I can work with difficult people. So I'll be able to fit in wherever you want me. Mm. Now see, that, that's a powerful benefit because it, it says, you know, the, the interviewer is thinking, gosh, she's going to have to work down at XYZ and, you know, they're maniacs down there and they'll be mean <laughs> to her. And, well, I can fit in, so you can put me wherever you, you want me. So that's, that's good. It's, it's a selling point. Here's another one. Uh, I can show up on time so you don't have to worry about me being late. Mm-hmm. I can, so I'll be able to. Here's another one. I can organize my work so you can expect me to be efficient. Okay. You see, the, the combination here is what I can do. It's not what I could do, what I can do. Mm-hmm. And then you're drawing a conclusion that's to the benefit of the interviewer. Okay. Those are really powerful. What if they ask you a question and it's something you don't know how to do yet, but you believe you could learn how to do it? Well, you could say something like, um, just tell the truth. I mean, mm-hmm. when, when everything else fails, just admit, say, mm-hmm. you know, I haven't had experience with this, but uh, I would approach this by learning it in the following way. First thing I would do is I'd get on the Internet, mm-hmm. and I would look and pick out good resources that are going to teach me how to tackle this problem mm-hmm. or this, this learning. Then I'd figure out the best way I could learn it within my budget. Right. And then once I figured this out, then I would learn the skill. For example, that's a, I was just thinking, that's something I did when I learned how to play uh, classical guitar. Sure. I, I thought, I'd like to do this, so I got into the process, got a teacher, then I learned how to do it. And that's I'm stretching great. it, really. I play bass guitar. <laughs> but it's, a, it's the same thing. So you, you can convert one of these questions into a series of steps that would show what you would do. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good example. You know, I work with one client who is fresh out of college, and I sent her home with some homework once, and she came back, and I was so impressed because she'd done such a good job. And I said, wow, how did you know how to do this? And she said, well, you know, I didn't know how, and so I went out to YouTube, and I searched for a video, and I found an instructional video on how to do it, and I was able to teach myself. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow. She just showed initiative and you know, she really went after it in a way that I haven't seen with some of my other clients. And even though she is pretty new out of school and doesn't have a lot of experience, whoever eventually hires her will be very lucky because she is very self-motivated and she's smart and she can figure these things out. And so I think sometimes when you're just starting out, um, rather than just saying, no, I don't know how to do it or no, I've never done that. I mean, showing how would you learn Mm. is really helpful. That's what I would call a behavioral predictor. Mm -hmm. A really good interviewer is going to hear the candidates talk about uh, things that are just so so stellar. They just hit you between the eyes Mm -hmm. that reflect. There's no doubt that this person is, like you were saying, is going to be innovative or uh, show initiative. So there's no doubt based on the way that the answer came about that's a behavioral predictor. Right. And if an interviewer can get two or three of those in an interview, that's phenomenal. Absolutely. Absolutely. So one other question I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, we've talked a lot about how to answer questions and how to um, speak about yourself. But what about things like what you wear to an interview, sort of the clothing that you wear? Do you have mm. any recommendations about that? Yeah, I do. Um uh, dress like the people are going to dress around you at work. Now, mm-hmm. if you're going to be in a warehouse, uh, I would dress up a little bit, mm-hmm. but not that much. You dress like you're going to work. Another principle is to dress in a way that people are not distracted by your appearance. Yes. You want the interviewer to be attracted to your words, mm-hmm. to your character, to your skills, so that you don't want your appearance to interfere with that. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes for mannerisms. People will uh, crack their knuckles or make funny sounds or smack. I've I've done thousands of interviews myself, and I've I've heard all of these different things. And people just don't know that they're distracting from the quality of their answers. So dress well, 
uh, have a good appearance, but don't let it interfere with the, the content of your character and your skills that comes through in the interview. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, really when you go into an interview, what you want is exactly like you said, you want them to focus on you and your skills. Um, After the interview is over and when the interviewer goes back and writes a review Mm -hmm. or speaks to someone, you want them to remember what you were good at, not uh, that you cracked your knuckles the whole time or not that you uh, came in with chewing gum in your mouth or something. That's not where you want people to focus their energy. Um, yeah. This, uh, this reminds me, I, I had an experience when I was in graduate school. I had a professor who was teaching me uh, a really hard class. Mm-hmm. And uh, the first day of class, I, was, I had to stand in the back of the room. There weren't enough seats there. Oh. And I took the final exam on the first row because people couldn't, they wouldn't, wouldn't stay with it. Okay. And this particular professor had uh, a mannerism that was very disturbing. I mean, people would talk about it and they would make fun of him and so right. forth. But I, I didn't notice, I noticed the mannerism in the first class, but I didn't notice it again to the midterm. Okay. Because the way he was talking, what he said enraptured me. It just pulled me into mm-hmm. the nature of what he was saying rather than how he looked. Mm-hmm. So if, if candidates can use that approach and give examples that just kind of drag people into their world and their skill set, then eventually they'll get a good job. Right, right. You know, that actually makes me think, think of an example as well from okay. school. I had a professor um, years ago, and I won't say where, <laughs> who, she was a fantastic professor. I really enjoyed her class. Um, but she had a giant diamond wedding ring. Goodness I mean, it was yeah. like the, the kind that a celebrity would have. And the entire class, that ring just caught light. And every time she would talk, you're, you're just following her <laughs> hand, right? And I found it to be very, very distracting. Beautiful ring, super distracting. And at the end of the class, you know, when the semester was over, I was talking with a couple of my classmates and I mentioned, gosh, that ring was so distracting. And they said, wow, us too. So the whole class had been focusing for the whole semester on this ring because it was just ginormous. <laughs> and and so, you know, when I'm talking to clients, I try to tell them, you know, minimize your jewelry, minimize yeah. your distractions. Because yeah. again, you don't want people to be focused on something other yeah. than your skills. That's right. Yeah. Well, I, that's a good, I'm going to use that one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this um, this was a fantastic professor, but um, she did have this this ring that was just giant. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, is there any other advice that you would like to share with our listeners today? I mean, you like we talked about, you just have a wealth of experience in this in this subject. The um, the best advice I can give is to not quit. Mm-hmm. There's uh, It's not easy to get jobs now, Mm -hmm. and it's not easy to deal with um, interviewers who 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 are either too authoritarian or bossy or unprepared. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. And for example, I noticed in your book, for maybe fifty contacts, you might get four interviews. Right. I saw that. It's very uh, very true. I think you Mm -hmm. have to contact a lot to get interviews. Right. And when you're having those interviews, if you don't get the job. You pick up and you go on and you keep looking. In fact, I've recommended to people all along the way, you never stop looking until you have the letter of employment. Mm. And so don't stop. Don't quit. If you have a worthy goal, it's worthy enough to deserve all of your attention for a long time. Then sometimes it makes sense to change your goal and move to something else. But basically, don't quit. Right. I think that is such helpful advice. I mean, I especially like when you said, don't stop until you have the letter, because especially big corporations, you know, the hiring manager may want to hire you all day long. You may be his favorite candidate and say something happened to his budget and he's been asked to put it on hold. It may have nothing to do with you. And if you stopped looking, I mean, you could have put yourself back months because you just assumed that was going to happen. I've seen that so many times. And by the way, um, 
often there's somebody who has an inside track. Right. And you don't know who they are. Right. And that person is getting somebody else's attention who's really going to make the decision. Right. So never assume that you're not going to get a job. Keep working in your search the whole time. And, you know, I think that's a great point, too, because sometimes we take it really personally when we don't get an offer. And sometimes it's not always about us. I mean, sometimes it is. Sometimes we, um, you know, we're just not the right candidate. But when you mentioned sometimes somebody else has that inside track, there may be somebody that's just, they know that's the person they're going to hire. They just, they just know it. And when that happens, there may have been nothing that you could have done, you know, to, to get that position. So it's, you know, don't get discouraged. Um, and I think the one other thing to always keep in mind too, is that not all companies, many companies don't send you a letter to tell you, you have not been selected. And it's unfortunate. I know it can be disappointing to not hear back, but I think to be a successful job seeker, you just have to accept to persist. Yeah. that's just how it's going to be and you're going to keep moving forward. Yeah, and another thing too, some of the best jobs are out of town. Mm-hmm. Whatever town you're in, mm-hmm. if you're willing to go out of town, you improve the likelihood you're going to get something that matches your goals. Absolutely. The more specific that you are, I always think the longer that it will take you to find exactly what you want. So if you can broaden your search to more than one location, it can really help to open up a lot of doors. Well, it's been great to talk to you today. Can you please share, um, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, My website is paulcgreen.com. It's all lowercase, uh, no lines, nothing like just paulcgreen.com. And when you get on the website in the upper right-hand corner of the homepage, it says contact. Mm-hmm. Just click on that. And by the way, you'll see all of the other stuff I've done. It's uh, it's fun stuff. But if you do that and send me an email, then I will send you uh, a copy of a structured interview just to kind of give you a handle on what they're like. Oh, that's great. That's great. And you provided a copy for me here today. And definitely, sure. I think everyone should reach sure. out. Yeah. It'd be a very useful yeah. tool. Super. Great. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for joining me. This is a pleasure. This has just been so helpful. Um, And thank you, everyone, for listening. Tune in next week for another edition of the Copeland Coaching Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Copeland Coaching Podcast today with your host, Angela Copeland. Tune in next time to get more great tips on turning your job search into a slam dunk.